Hi everyone. <laughs> Um, welcome to this training session. Thank you all for coming along. Uh, my name is Kieran, as some of you might know. Um, so the focus of this session is going to be on advanced tactics um, and basically putting aside the wank. What that means is helping you guys work out how to beat teams that are better than you. That's basically what I'm going to focus on. So I reckon the real key to debating once you get a little bit of experience and can put a speech together is the kind of little tricks uh, and tips that can help you beat teams that are better than you. Setting up a good case, preparing a good case, and delivering it effectively. Um, so, Linton, if you don't mind. Linton's going to be my mouse bitch. Um, so, this is the outline of this session. Basically, I'm going to start by looking uh, at some tips for what you can do before the debate, when you get the topic, and when you're prepping, uh, how you can use that time most effectively. Uh, and then look at some ways that you can construct an effective case, um, hopefully without being too repetitive um, about the case construction stuff that you've already done. Um, and then look at a few other things like manner, rebuttal, and team dynamics. Actually, I'm not talking about team dynamics, but I'm sure you guys can work out whatever that means. All right, Linton? Cool. Before the debate, topic selection. OK. So this is something that's going to be really crucial for all of you who end up going to Easter's. Um, actually, can I get a quick show of hands? How many people here are going to Easter's? Good. Okay, most. Um, but even the people who aren't going, I'm sure, are going to have to come across the three-topic format uh, and how to go about selecting. Um, I reckon the key thing to think about with topic selection is playing to your strengths. So you've got to work out, what is your team good at? What are the issues that you feel comfortable with? What are the kind of cases you're strong at? And, and preference those first. However, I mean, in reality, you're often going to get a topic where one person knows a fair bit about it and everyone else has absolutely no idea what's going on. Okay? So the key test you're going to have to follow is, do you think that within that half an hour prep time, you're going to be able to pass on enough information to run a good case? Right? Or is this some obscure area of knowledge that only you understand that's too difficult to communicate? Okay? So the other thing you're going to have to think about is whether you're comfortable being on a particular side of a debate. Okay? Whether you actually feel confident enough arguing, say, against abortion to make that case compellingly. Right? One thing that I think people don't spend enough time on emphasizing in debating is believing in a side can actually make a really big difference. Right? Having said that, obviously that shouldn't be your number one focus, because there's going to be times when you're going to have to argue against your beliefs, and there's simply nothing you can do about that. Right? But if you're in a situation where there's two topics that you feel are pretty even, but you really believe in one particular case more strongly, I would suggest that you pick that, right? because it really does come across. Okay. The final thing I'd, I think I'd say in, uh, before the debate, in selecting the topic, is considering the strengths of the opposition. So one thing I remember from um, a final of the Australasian Championships a few years ago is one of the topics related specifically to the honours thesis that one of the speakers in the debate had done. Right? Another of the topic related to the honours thesis of a speaker on the other team. Right? So unsurprisingly, both teams vetoed that particular topic uh, from their respective sides. Okay? So obviously, you can only do that once you know your opposition better. But I think the more you debate, the more you get an understanding of what kind of issues it's probably worth uh, staying away from. Okay. So those are a few rough ideas. I mean, the obvious rule of thumb is, I'll give you guys one second, is um, you know, don't artificially cut out a topic just because you think another team may be good at it. I mean, obviously, any debate you can win if you believe strongly enough in your arguments. But it's just something to keep in mind when you're looking for the little things that can make a difference. Uh, but Heba? Sure. At Easter's, it's not particularly likely. I think the topics are generally things that are pretty well known. But especially uh, once you get to the finals, you often get some pretty challenging topics. Like you may get an international relations topic that a lot of people won't know about. But for the most part, I think you're not going to worry too much about really high level knowledge. OK. So using your prep time. So how many of you have done like school debating or some debating in the past? Most people. OK, so I'm sure you've come across all the usual cliches like brainstorm and then team split and all of that kind of stuff. What I'm going to focus on is, I think, the way you strategize about your prep, because I think that's what's most important. Um, so the first thing I'd say is when you only have half an hour, 
you need to really make sure you use your time wisely. And what that means is that you can't afford for one team member to have no idea what's going on in a particular debate, right? That's often going to happen. You get a topic about, you know, uh, Kosovo or something. You have no clue what's going on. What do you do, okay? What I'd suggest is that with every debating topic, your starting point should be making sure that everyone on the team understands the context for that particular issue, right? So as soon as you get the round about Libya, right, you should spend like 30 seconds as a team basically saying, you know, so this is what this debate is going to be about, right? This is what's happening at the moment in Libya. This is why we're having the debate, right? Because the worst thing is for someone to sit there silently through that five minute brainstorm staring at a blank piece of paper. Right? which happens all the time. You need to make sure everyone has a certain amount of knowledge that they can actually contribute. Okay? The second, like, I guess, big picture recommendation that I'd make is brainstorm strategically. Right? So I'm sure when you're doing school debating, what would often happen in a brainstorm is basically writing up every single thing you can think about a particular topic. Right? Every random argument, everything that comes to mind. Right? As you guys advance and become better debaters, what you want to be doing is work out what you think the most important issue in the debate is going to be, and spend the majority of your time, time thinking about that particular issue. Right? How are you going to win that particular issue? Okay? And the other thing I'd say, which is really, really crucial, is be preemptive. Right? Don't just think about your case. Think about what you think the biggest hit you're going to get from the opposition will be. So let's do an example. Let's say the topic is that we should launch military strikes against Libya, right? Slightly redundant now, but let's say that that's the topic, right? What do you think the most kind of obvious thing the negative team is going to say to that? Civil civilian casualties? Okay, that's one. What else? Starting a war? Yeah, okay. What else? Breaching on sovereignty? Okay. Right? So let's go through all of those, right? Let's start with civilian casualties, right? You're the affirmative team. You're talking about military strikes. How could you preemptively deal with the issue of civilian casualties? What kind of things could you say? Yeah. Okay. People are dying anyway. What else? Right. More people will die. What else? Great, OK. So you could do a couple of things. You could do uh, what the boys have said in the back, which is you know, the, the problem is already so significant in terms of civilian casualties. Right? But you could also do what Heber says, right? which is we can do whatever we can to stop civilians being killed. Okay? What about that issue of sovereignty? So the point Leachy just made was it's a violation of Libya's sovereignty to bomb them effectively. How could you preemptively deal with that? Perfect, perfect, right? That's really crucial. And if you really want to beat, beat teams, right, you have to think preemptively, right? You can't get into a debate and be like, oh, OK, now I can introduce this rebuttal about human rights, right? You want to be really on the front foot at any point. So something that's really strong is at first affirmative to say, you know what, we accept that we're uh, you know, overriding you know, Colonel Gaddafi's uh, sovereignty to slaughter his civilians without any consequences. We just don't give a shit. Right? Human rights are more important. right? Or even say, we accept that this military strike may cause some civilian casualties, but we're going to do everything we can to stop that, and the alternative is worse. Right? By doing that, you put the onus on the negative team to not just say, well, civilian casualties are bad, sovereignty is bad, but really deal with your response to that. Okay? Obviously, there are limits to that. In a 30-minute prep, you can't spend 30 minutes thinking about what the opposition is going to run and preempting it. Because often they won't run those things. They may not be as smart as you guys are. Right? But you have to be clear about what the biggest issues are that you're going to be hit on if you want to beat good teams. Right? Teams that aren't going to miss these obvious arguments. Does that make sense to everyone? OK. Good. Um, the other thing I'd suggest in terms of your preparation time, if you're struggling for arguments, right, is analyze all of the different groups affected by a particular policy. OK? So we'll look at this a little bit later. But say you're doing a debate about banning pornography. Who are the groups who are affected by that plan? Pornographers, yeah. Women, which women? 
Great, so the individual women who actually acted in these films and also women more generally. Yeah? Addicts. Addicts of pornography, right? Who else? Children. Great, okay. So those are all groups that are affected that you can make separate arguments about. We'll come back to that later, right? But often a great way to get over that mental block is list every stakeholder you think is affected by a particular policy, right? Because that's a great way to frame arguments. Okay, the only other thing I'm going to say in preparation is it's really important for the third speaker to be strongly aware of their role in the prep, right? Because as a third speaker, you can be effective or ineffective. You can sit on the sidelines or you can actually help your team, right? What do you guys think a good third speaker would do in a prep situation, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? Like, I think a really strong third speaker, firstly, will be helping the other speakers with their arguments, right? I think most importantly, the first speaker, who has the most crucial argument. But also, the third speaker is the person with the luxury to think about some of the preemptive stuff that I was discussing, right? Think about what do you think the biggest hits are you're going to get to this case, and help your teammates weave in points of rebuttal to that, right? Or be on the front foot and responding to those points in their speech, okay? So you want to make sure your third speaker is actually a weapon rather than just be the person who's sitting there twiddling their, their thumbs for 48 minutes. Okay? Cool. Uh, next slide, please. OK. So constructing a killer case. OK. So looking at the affirmative team, in most debates, what the topic's going to do is ask the affirmative to propose a reform to the status quo. Right? Do you, do you guys know what I mean by the term status quo? Right, OK? So basically, the topic will say, uh, we'll be asking you to frame a solution, a change from what's currently happening, right? So the, the freshest final, for example, Matthew, what was the solution, uh, the change to the status quo you were proposing? Um, which says that um, condom use is for sexual Right, OK? So basically, the topic was, I think, that condom use should be mandatory in pornography. What that's basically saying is the status quo is that it's not mandatory to have to wear a condom in a pornographic film. As the affirmative, their role was to propose a change to that. Okay? So that's the simple way of explaining it. Right? Now, the key issue then is how you construct a case which really maximizes your advantage as the affirmative. Right? Because you have a huge advantage. You get to choose what the solution is to the problem. You get to choose a reform which changes the way things are working as they are. Okay? So the first thing you have to do is work out what the problem is in any particular debate. Okay? So let's look, talk about that con mandatory condom use issue. Hey, Tom. Um, what is the problem that you're responding to? Why are you having the debate? OK. Do you want to explain it a little bit more, Michael? Okay, right. Cool. Um, so the problem, right, is that currently in pornography, when people do not use condoms, they're at a higher use of sexual disease. So as the affirmative team, the first words out of the first speaker's mouth should be, there is a major problem right now, right? In the pornography industry, people are not using condoms. They're facing serious problems of sexual disease, right? And then we propose to fix that, okay? So let's look at some other problems. Let's look at the topic like, this house support, supports assassinating Colonel Gaddafi, the Libyan leader. What's, what's the status quo? What's happening right now? Can anyone tell me? He's killing all these people? Great. And what's the current response? What's in uprising? Right. OK. So currently what they're doing is basically trying to enforce what's called a no-fly zone, which is stopping the Libyan military from flying its aircrafts over Libyan airspace and basically bombing the shit out of the people. Right? And that involves military strikes. But does that include assassination?
Not strictly, right? Like, strictly speaking, right now, the West isn't trying to assassinate Gaddafi, right? So the UN resolution which authorized them to, to act in Libya did not authorize them to kill Colonel Gaddafi as one of the aims of their mission, okay? So the status quo in that debate, right, is Gaddafi is killing people, the West is doing some stuff, but it's not trying to assassinate Gaddafi, right? That's the starting point for the affirmative team, okay? So the next step is proposing a solution, proposing a model, right? And as the affirmative team, what would you be arguing? This is assassinating Gaddafi. Okay, and why would you be proposing that? Great. Okay. And what would you be saying on the affirmative about the current policy? Exactly, right? And that's one of the most powerful things you can do as the affirmative. Basically say, the status quo is this. The West is launching strikes, is enforcing a no-fly zone, but the status quo is failing. We need to do more. To really help the Libyan civilians, we need to go further and kill Gaddafi. Right? So that's basically saying, this is the problem. This is failing, right? The current approach is failing. We need to go further, okay? Let's look at a topic like, um, this house supports introducing a carbon tax. What's the status quo? Global warming, Global warming? okay. <laughs> yeah? Can you give me a bit more on that, Regina? Okay, and what's the current policy response? Okay, anyone else? Okay, right, so the current action isn't anything particularly significant, right? There is some federal funding for like renewable energy and that kind of thing, but there isn't a major government response to tackle that problem, right? See, on the affirmative team, you want to be saying there's a major problem right now. The current policy response isn't doing enough, right? And we need to introduce a carbon tax. However, there's a couple of things that you guys should remember in terms of how you set up that context and model that can make it more powerful. So I think you probably had a, had a session with, was it Amit or Tim? Amit? Did Amit go over trends and tipping points and all of that stuff? I don't want to be repetitive if he has. No? Okay. So what do you think I mean when I use the word trend? Pattern? Absolutely. Okay, so if you have a topic where, I'm not sure what the wording of that particular topic was, but I assume it's something along the lines of, we should use biofuels as a major source of energy, or something along those lines. Right, okay. So the trend you could be pointing to is more and more we're emphasizing focusing on, on new forms of energy, right, to reduce the dependence on oil, right? And biofuels is a natural progression in that trend. Why do you think it'd be matter? Why do you think it's, it's important to make your policy solution the natural culmination of a trend? Why do you think that's powerful? Right. Right. It's, it's reasonability, right? And every time you're proposing a solution, you want to look reasonable, right? You're not inventing this biofuels issue out of nowhere, right? You're proposing it because this is the logical culmination of a trend. Okay? Does that make sense? So on the affirmative team, every time you're asked to propose a particular policy, if you can show that this is the natural end point to a trend, that's really powerful. Right? However, in the same way, you can also say that a trend is really damaging. So say you had a topic about torturing terror suspects. What could you argue the trend is in terms of the government's policy towards terrorists?
So what's some examples? Right? Okay. What about in Australia? What are some ways in which we have cut down on the civil, uh, civil liberties of terrorist hunting? Right? Okay. So there's been legal reforms. Yeah. What else? Right? Okay. Okay. So basically, the government right, has decided that terror suspects should be in a different class of criminal offenders. And there's been a consistent trend towards weakening their civil, li civil liberties. Right? So if you're arguing against torture, how would you go about using that trend to bolster your case? Right? OK. You can argue that there's a really, really harmful trend right, that needs to end. Right? that Western liberal democracies have gone the wrong way in terms of prosecuting terrorism. Right? It's a harmful trend which reduces liberty, and that trend needs to end. Okay? Another useful thing you can use in terms of contextualizing the case is tipping points. Do you guys know what a tipping point is? Anyone? What do you think the word means? Oh, the phrase means. Uh, well, I mean, yes. I mean, th that's an example of that. <laughs> that wasn't quite what I was going to use. But um, so a tipping point is basically saying, this is as far as we can go, right? So they often use that in terms of climate change, right? If we get to the point where we reach an extra, I think it's two degrees of global warming, right? That'll be the point of no return. We won't be able to actually stop some of the environmental damage that has occurred. Okay? So if that's basically something you can use to suggest that we need to act now and we can't wait any later. So if you're doing the carbon tax debate, how would you point to a tipping point? Right, okay. Can someone use a tipping point to justify why we should have a carbon tax now? Right. Excellent. OK. So what you're basically doing is saying, oh, sorry, go to Marco. Right. I mean, in a debate, like obviously you're not scientists in that debate. You don't have to be able to say there's x degrees of warming right now or whatever. But you can say, we are at the point right now of no return. If we continue to fail to act against climate change, right, the damage will be so severe, and we won't be able to fix that. Right. And framing your context, fa framing your problem like that is really effective because it puts the onus on the negative team to respond to that. Right? You're basically showing this is an urgent problem. We need to act right now. Okay? And that's something that's really, really powerful in debates to undermine the negative team. Okay. So let's look now at how you structure a model strategically. Right? Do, does everyone know what a model is? Okay? So the model is the solution to the problem that we've been discussing. Okay? The first thing I want to mention is this idea of detail. How much detail do you think you need to have in a model? What do people think? Right, exactly, right? It's always going to depend on the debate, right? You don't need to, you know, look at if you're imposing a, t a carbon tax, you don't need to explain how much every single person in the environmental department is going to get paid in terms of assessing the, you know, carbon emissions of every company, right? That kind of stuff is obviously going to be redundant, right? However, I think it's important to use detail to your advantage. So everything we were discussing before about being preemptive, right, can be applied in your model, OK? So let's, uh, like one of the topics that I've debated before is uh, a topic about giving uh, priority for uh, asylum to people who, are, who have fought oppressive regimes. Does that topic make sense? So for example, uh, someone in Libya who's fought against the Libyan government, if they come to Australia, we should give them priority uh, in their asylum claims. Okay? So that's what the topic was. Right? Now, what do you think could be a really obvious problem with doing that? 
if you make that like a blanket principle. Okay, um, and that is a problem, but let's focus specifically on why it might not be right to give these people priority. What could these people have done? Right. Right, okay. So these people who have, say, fought the Libyan dictator may not have clean hands themselves, right? They may have killed and raped civilians. They may, have, may not be the kind of people we necessarily want in the country, right? Now, how do you think you could be preemptive about that in your model? How do you think you could respond to that? Okay, right? What else? What about the test for who you grant asylum? How could you tweak that to deal with that problem? Right, absolutely, right? You could restrict it. You could say, we're happy to give asylum to all people fleeing from the Libyan regime who fought the Libyan regime. However, if we have evidence that any of these people committed atrocities against civilians, they wouldn't get this priority, right? And that's the kind of thing you can do strategically, right, to cut out some of the obvious attacks on you from the negative, right? Because the negative team is going to be like, well, what you're doing is helping other murderers Right? get a free ride into Australia. And what you can do in your model is actually explain how the worst of the worst people aren't going to be given the same privileges as other people. Okay? Right? And that's the balance you have to strike. Right? The risk you take every time you do something preemptive or cut out a portion of the debate right, is that you become a little bit soft. Right? You basically restrict the debate too much. Right? But that's always going to be a judgment call. In this kind of debate, you're still letting in a huge number of refugees. You're just cutting out the worst murderers, right? Which is totally reasonable. Okay? So the other thing I want to mention to you in terms of uh, your strategy about your models, right, is plausibility. So how, how important is it that your model is plausible, that your model is realistic? What do you guys think about that? Right, exactly. I mean, look, in debating, obviously, to some extent, you're asked to suspend disbelief, right? You're asked to propose solutions that may never in the real world ever happen, right? But at the same time, you should try and be reasonable as much as possible. One thing you can always do to make your model seem more realistic, right, <coughs> is explain why, even if it isn't going to happen, it should happen, okay? So let's look at an example, like, say, the US intervening in Sudan. Right? So as I'm sure most of you know, there's been a genocide in Sudan for a number of years. Right? But the obvious problem with the US intervening is it's just not going to happen. Right? They're dealing with a number of different wars. You know, there's so many different problems affecting them. It doesn't sound realistic. Right? How could you argue that it's in the US's interest to intervene? So these are all good reasons for the US to do so, right? Maybe in a more limited form. One thing you can do to make your case more realistic is say, you know what, we accept that it's going to be difficult to convince the you know, American Congress to authorize this kind of intervention, right? People, there's every chance people will be against it, right? But at the end of the day, it is in the US's interest to do so, right? Because they have to act now because there are such serious humanitarian consequences, right? 
And that's totally fair in a debate, right? You never have to prove that X proposal is going to get 50% or more votes in a parliament, right? That's not your onus, right? But what you do need to do is show why it's in the interest of the party to do so, right? Even if they don't end up actually doing that, even if it doesn't seem realistic. Does that make sense to everyone? Absolutely, absolutely. But I think that's a separate argument. So you can definitely argue there's a moral obligation. But for the purposes of this, you want to be really practical. Why does it help them? Why should they do it even if, you know, right now they're not going to? OK? A um, couple of other things here, which I'm not sure whether to go through, depending on what you did in your session. Did you guys discuss all the problem solution stuff and hard and soft models? OK. In that case, I'm not going to bore you by doing all of that stuff again. Yes, yes. What I might do is very quickly we'll go through a couple of examples just to make sure that everyone's um, on top of that stuff. So firstly, can someone explain to me what is, what is a hard line model? What does that mean? And what is a soft line model? I think that's a really good example. So basically, <laughs> uh, so basically, the hard and soft line stuff is referring to <laughs> is referring to how big a change you're making from the status quo. Okay. So let's take Rowan's example. The topic is that we should ban abortion, right? Which is obviously a change from the status quo. If you take the hard line, you're saying we ban abortion in all cases, including rape, including incest, all cases. Right? And then the soft line, you can use Rowan's example. Right? Ridiculous exceptions, limitations. We're going to ban it in like the most unrealistic situations. Okay? What, do you, what should you be aiming for in a debate? Right. Okay? Somewhere in the middle. Right? Because if you can find a reasonable middle ground, right, that's often going to be the most effective way to do it. Okay? So what is, what is the problem strategically with banning it in the most limited solution, cases ever? What is the problem with that? Okay. Yeah. Why does that matter? Okay. That's the first reason. It makes it a bad debate. And when adjudicators get shitty, that doesn't help anyone. Okay. What else? Yeah. Oh, you didn't have your hand up. Sorry. Um. Yep. Right. Okay. No, but I'm looking at what's the problem with the really soft line. Perfect. That's a really important thing, right? If you're making an argument about banning abortion, which is saying, you know, the, the fetus should have rights, this is morally wrong, you can't really do that when you say, oh, but we're still going to ab uh, allow abortion in all cases except this outrageous aberration, right? It, it really cuts out your own ability to make arguments, okay? And that's what we call, um, that's what we call a problem-solution gap, right? So if you're saying that the problem in the debate is that abortion is immoral, it's incredibly harmful, it's so serious, and your solution is to ban it in the most limited circumstances, do you see how there's a gap there? Right? You're not actually solving your problem. Okay? That's all I want to say about that, because I don't want to bore you guys with the same stuff. But I think that's one of the most crucial tactical things to really improve, um, uh, improve your debate. So uh, let's look at that example. And sorry, what was your name? Olivia. Olivia. Okay. So Olivia makes a really good point. So say in a banning abortion debate, you say we should ban it in all cases, including rape and incest. Why could that be problematic for the affirmative? Right. Okay. And it means that you have to try and defend things that you don't necessarily have to defend. Right. Like the adjudicators will be fine with you making concessions and restrictions that are reasonable, right? As long as you don't go too far, right? It's okay to say, even though we believe the fetus should have rights, we accept that in the most extreme situations when a woman has been raped, maybe that should take precedence, right? 
So what you should be trying to do in your model, in your strategy, right, is picking something in the middle ground, which is reasonable, but still lets you argue the principles that you want. Okay? Is it? Yeah. What do people think? Okay, why? Hold on, guys, one at a time. Um, right. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, look, I think one great thing about debating is that you're never precluded from running particular arguments, right? Like, I, re I reckon you, in most cases you'd struggle to prove the skeptic case. But that isn't to say that you can never do it, right? It's just that for the average reasonable adjudicator, it would be fair to expect a bloody good skeptic case, right? Considering how significant the weight of the scientific evidence is, is in the other direction, right? So what I would say is if you're going to do something like that, you really have to go all in, right? You can't say, I don't believe climate change. But also, if you do believe climate change, there's all these different things, right? I think in those situations, when you're taking such an extreme position, right, you have to be willing to defend it all the way, which is why I don't think it's a sensible position, right? It's very rare that a topic will be set when there isn't a problem. In fact, it almost never happens. Right? You can quibble about the extent of the problem. You can certainly say global warming isn't as significant right now to justify this massive alteration to the economy or whatever. Right? But it's very rare that you can just say climate change doesn't exist or Gaddafi killing people isn't happening. Because right? there's no point for the debate otherwise. Yeah, I mean... It, it doesn't. It just changes what the clash is, right? Um, because it makes it a very different debate. And you're totally within your rights as the negative team to change what the clash is, right? I just don't think it's probably like strategically smart, right? In that situation, okay? But that does take me to the negative team, right? And what their options are strategically, okay? So we've talked about how the affirmative team will be asked to propose a change from the status quo. Right? They're saying there's a problem with what's going right now, right? and here's our solution. What are the options for a negative team? Right? So we've heard one from James, which is reject the problem. What else? Right, OK. So basically saying, you know what? We accept that climate change is an issue, but the carbon tax is a bad solution. Right? Here's our alternative solution. So in the carbon tax debate, what do you think you guys could argue? Carbon farming? Okay, I don't actually know what carbon farming is. Okay. Um, I mean, does that mean like stopping deforestation and that kind of thing? Carbon sinks, maybe? Right, okay. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Right, so that's pretty similar to, I think, the Tony Abbott kind of direct action plan, right? Which is basically the government paying farmers to try and trap carbon in the soil, that kind of thing, right? What other solutions are talked about with climate change? Alternatives. Okay. Okay, right, so basically not doing much but relying on the market to, uh, to stop um, over-polluting. What else? Right, okay, so government subsidies, government investments to spare on different technologies. What else? What's the really obvious thing that gets talked about all the time when you look at models for? Right, 
an emissions trading scheme, right? So these are all, all options that you can consider, right, as your counter model. Okay? Now, there's a third option, okay, which you can take. So the first option, as we mentioned, is denying the problem. Very rarely worthwhile. In fact, I'd say almost never worthwhile, right? The second option is proposing a different solution, right? The third option is basically saying, defending the status quo, perfect, right? Um, so basically saying, you know what, even if the status quo isn't perfect, right, the harms of the affirmative solution are much more significant. Okay? What they're doing will make the problem much worse when compared with the status quo. Okay? Cool. All right. So I'm going to move on because I assume that you guys have done a little bit of that. But right, there's, there's some of the crucial case construction things. All right. Uh, Linton's left, which is annoying. All right. So next. Stakeholders. Okay, what do I mean by stakeholders? Right. Great. Okay, so let's go through that example that we discussed before about banning porn. Okay? So some of the groups that were affected by the policy we discussed were like children, the specific women involved, uh, women more generally, as I think Olivia mentioned, um, and as well as that, I, I guess, teenagers, whatever. Right? How are some of these groups affected? How are teenagers affected by banning porn? Okay? And why does that matter? How could you make an argument out of that? Yeah. Right? Okay. So if you supported banning porn, you could say that that porn gives teens really bad messages about sex, right? which is why it needs to be banned. How could you flip that on the other side? How could you argue it's actually good for teens? Okay. Okay. Now, okay, we'll come to that because I think that's a separate issue. Um, let, let's, let's deconstruct that issue a little bit more, what Sahil just said. That's a sexual outlet. When we say it's a sexual outlet for teens, which teens are we talking about? <laughs> yeah? Okay, definitely one group, Matt. Who else? <laughs> uh, let's keep that out. We'll keep that outside, Tara. Uh, okay. What kind of teens do you think we, who'd actually need a sexual outlet most? Okay, conservative households. Sorry, getting a lot. What else? Right? Great. Okay, who else? Right, right. And particularly, I'd say, even in, in religious communities, particularly for homosexuals, right? Because in, in certain communities, right, it may be really difficult to get that outlet, right? To get that outlet for your sexual expression, right? And watching porn could be one of the few ways that you actually get exposure to that. Why would that matter? Why could that be a good thing? Why do we care about an outlet for sex anyway? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Possibly, right? So it could lead them to more risky activities, right? What else? Great. Absolutely, right? So if you're, say, you know, a gay teenager, right, who's insecure about their identity, who's maybe not even sure that they're gay, right, maybe it's a really good thing to have access to something like this, to know other people, you know, are turned on by the same thing as you, right? And to actually maybe even confirm that, that you are gay, right? All of these things are potential benefits, right? And the crucial thing to take away from that that's more broadly applicable is any time you look at a group, right, you need to really deconstruct who that group is, right? Teenagers aren't all the same, right? Women aren't all the same, right? So let's look at women in this debate, banning porn, right? So Olivia mentioned there's a couple of different broad groups of women. There's 
you know, I guess women more generally, and then there's the individual women in the porn industry. Right? How are women more generally affected? Okay, great. Right, so it sends a really, really bad message about women. The kind of scenes that are depicted lead to harmful perceptions of women. What could you say on the other side? How could this actually be good for women? So that's analyzing the same group and coming up with completely different arguments, right? Let's look at the, look at the wo women, right? Right? How are they affected? And are there subgroups within these groups? Okay. And why would some people get into porn if they're not consenting? How would that come about? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, do you guys want to explain that? Finances, how would that? Right, great, okay. And what would the other side say about who these women are, right? So the affirmative is probably going to say that these are people who are often, you know, quite poor, quite desperate, they need this, and then they get coerced into really harmful practices. What could the other side say? Yeah. Great. Okay, so that's the characterization in favor of banning porn. How would the other side analyze the same group of women? Okay. Great. And is it that wrong to just make a choice, right? If this is an easy way to make quick money, why can't you choose, right? Why isn't that rational even if you're poor, right? So the key thing to take out of that, right, is firstly that you can analyze the same group in different ways. But secondly, right, the real way to win these debates is how strategic you are about these groups. Because the reality is going to be somewhere in the middle of those two characterizations. Right? Either these women are hyper-empowered people who are making lots of money and get really happy and then live a happy life, right? or there's these, these slaves who are trafficked, who have no agency, who get abused. Right? The reality is they're probably a little bit of both, right? and the reality is probably somewhere in the middle most of the time. Right? So what's really, really effective when you're looking at different groups is to say, look, we accept that there are a small proportion of women assuming you're defending porn, a small portion of women who are coerced, who don't have these choices, and that's harmful. But for the vast majority of people, this is actually a really good choice, right? And vice versa, right? You win the characterization of how big these groups are and how significant their concerns are, right? And that's a nuance, which is really crucial, okay? So another example of that, very quickly, is a debate about banning the burqa, okay? So the burqa is obviously the Islamic um, headscarf, right? So as the affirmative team, right, who supports banning the burqa, how would you describe the women who wear the burqa? What kind of characterization would you want to prove? Great. 
Say hello. That, that's excellent, that's spot on. How would the other team characterize these women? Why would they be wearing pet? Right, absolutely, right? This is crucial to their connection with God, right? To be able to live their lives in a particular way, to adhere to a particular style of living, right? And so the reality, once again, is going to be somewhere in the middle. There probably are going to be some people who are super coerced, right? And there probably are going to be some people who are super empowered, have absolute choice, the reality is going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's where the debate's going to be won or lost, right? How you analyze those people in the middle and how much you can prove that your characterization is more realistic than the opposition. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone? What, what do you do with that spell? Like, we're going to have a couple of Okay, which, uh, which side were you arguing? Uh, we were arguing with the <laughs> Okay, right. So, I mean, so for everyone who doesn't know what that topic was, I think there's something in the lines of banning uh, anti abortion protesters from basically protesting outside abortion clinics, right? And so the issue that James identified is how do you characterize those protesters? Are, those, are these like crazy, violent, angry people, or are they just, you know, peaceful protesters? Right? So, so that's the issue, okay? How do people think that you'd argue James's side, right? That they're just more likely to be peaceful, nonviolent people? Okay. Right, exactly, right? So in that kind of debate, right, you, you obviously can't empirically prove that they're either crazy or totally benign, right? You're, all, you're gonna argue that. So what you want to, I think, do as much as possible is say, look, this is a probabilities game, okay? Most of these people are unlikely to be like that. Like, like you know, really violent abuse outside abortion clinics isn't actually that frequent. But in those limited situations, right, there are things we can do to actually stop those people. We can prosecute people who do that kind of thing, right? The worst kind of violence, right? So that's making a concession to some extent, right? You're accepting there are some crazies, but you're minimizing how big the group is, and you're saying that there's other ways to deal with that group. Okay, you back? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, if you can use those kind of examples, that's really useful um, in making this, this case more reasonable. Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to sprint through the last slide or so. Okay, strategic rebuttal. I'm not going to spend too much time on rebuttal. Hey. Um, and the reason for that is I've always really believed that rebuttal is something you learn by doing. It's very hard to have rebuttal theory because it's the kind of thing where you basically look at an argument and you try and find some weaknesses. So what I'm going to do is just highlight a few important things to look out for. Right? And hopefully you could apply some of these things in debates. So the first thing I'd say more generally is prioritizing rebuttal is absolutely crucial. I think the biggest weakness um, of novice debaters that I see is picking the wrong issues, right? Picking the you know, silly su like, you know, side comments someone made and spending a minute attacking them for it, right? That kind of thing is not going to be at the core of the debate. What you always have to be thinking as a team, when you're preparing for your rebuttal in the debate, is what's hurting our case most? Like, what's the issue, what's the argument that you think if they win, we're, we have no chance of winning, right? This is what's killing us, right? Particularly a third speaker, right? Even if you're ahead in a debate, you feel like you're going really well, you should be thinking, what's the argument identified by the opposition that we could lose, right? What's the thing that we're not winning yet? And you spend more of your time on that issue. Okay, so time allocation is crucial. Um, a few key things to look for in rebuttal, like a few common mistakes and arguments, are assertions. So can people tell me what an assertion is? Or 
Right, exactly. So saying something like, I don't know, people at private schools are smarter, right, is an assertion unless you really explain why that's true, right? But the important thing isn't to just say, well, the opposition just asserted this and then move on, right? You need to say this is an assertion and here's why it's wrong. Really go through that because you don't want to give them a chance to rebuild their argument later. Okay? The next thing is contradiction, right? So, an obvious example of a contradiction is if, in the same case, a team is arguing that some, something is both cheaper and more expensive, which surprisingly happens fairly often, right? If you can pick something, if you can say they contradicted themselves when they said this and this, that's really powerful, okay? However, one thing I'd say that's really crucial from a strategic perspective is be very, very careful when you're accusing the opposition of contradicting themselves. The worst thing as an adjudicator is when a team gets up and says, you know, you contradicted yourself on this, therefore your case is rubbish. And you're like, that's not a contradiction, right? That kills you. That absolutely kills you. So every time you think there's a contradiction, I think it's really worthwhile turning to your teammates and saying, Hey guys, they said this and this. Do you think this contradicts itself? Or is there a way for the opposition to explain it away? Okay? Is it just slightly inconsistent? Okay? Be very careful with contradiction. Um, and the last thing is, of course, a failure of causation. So what do you think that means? Right. Right. Okay. Um, so a great example of that is saying that the death penalty deters crime because having the death penalty in Australia meant that the crime rate reduced, right? What are some other reasons why the crime rate might reduce? More police, yeah. What else? Right? Right, less poor people committing crimes, yeah. What else? Perfect, right? Strong gun regulations reducing the capacity to kill other people, right? Which is not to say that the death penalty doesn't reduce crime, right? None of those facts proves that it doesn't, right? But when you see a team that basically says X leads to Y, you need to analyze whether they've actually made the links or they're just assuming that because we had the death penalty, we had all of these other things, right? I'm not sure if you guys remember the Simpsons episode where uh, Homer thinks that there's a particular rock that can fight off tigers. Yeah, right, exactly. So Homer's holding a rock and he's like, uh, and, then, and then Lisa says, well, maybe this could actually, uh, well, this, this is the kind of rock that can prevent tigers uh, ever existing in this area. And then Homer's like, okay, I would like to buy your rock. <laughs> right? That's an example of a failure of causation. Right? Simply because there are no tigers there doesn't mean that the rock has superpowers. Okay? So that's the example I would use. Okay, last slide, Lince. Do you mind going to the next one? Okay, MANA. Okay, I, I want to make two very quick points about MANA. The first is, it is really crucial to change your MANA depending on what the topic is, right? To get really, really aggressive and angry in, say, a sensitive debate about euthanasia or abortion looks terrible, right? And what's also bad is putting on some kind of really, really false passion for like a debate about a flat tax rate, something like that, right? You, what you've got to be thinking about your manner is, is it authentic? Is this the kind of thing you'd expect when you're looking at this particular type of topic? Okay? Um, and the other thing I'd say is what's absolutely crucial is adjusting your manner within your speech. Okay? If you're making a really crucial point, slow down, right? Slow down, make sure the adjudicator can get that point. Right? And in your introduction and conclusion, never just tail off. The thing that drives me insane is when people basically are in the last 30 seconds and they're like, you know, look at their notes a minute and you're like, ah, uh, and that's it. Right? So many people do that. That's it. Right? You need to be really strong, confident in your conclusion. Right? When you finish your point, you should be standing straight looking at the adjudicator, not picking up your papers and walking off and just tailing off, right? Those are the kind of things that really, really get noticed, especially by inexperienced adjudicators. Okay? Rob? Yeah. I mean, in that situation, you want to be s sitting down, right? But there's no reason just to do that awkward, uh, that's it, 
right? You can still have like a half sentence, right? Uh, therefore, we propose this case, right? That looks much more compelling than literally just walking off like, you know, you're about to get shot. <laughs> okay? You would. You, actually, that's very true. I'm, I'm really evil. Um, okay, Lint, good, done. All right, does anyone have any questions? I know that covered huge amounts of material, but the aim of that session is basically thinking strategically, not just thinking in terms of X argument, Y argument, but how you position yourself to be more likely to win the debate. So if anyone has any questions, if not, good luck tonight. Thanks.